Hey guys, welcome back to Catch My Six. Today, Ian is laying it out on the line for you guys. He's a buddy of ours that we served with. He has suffered with PTSD. He's suffered with suicide, uh, depression, all of it. And uh, he's laying it out on the line for us. He's being very transparent, very vulnerable. And uh, he just wants to share his story to help as many people as he can. So I hope today that you guys can benefit from his story learn a little bit about what he went through and what he did to better himself and get out of that situation. And, uh, you know, if you guys have anything you want to say, reach out to us on our Instagram or even leave a comment on anchor.fm. All right, we'll get into it. Oh man, so uh, episode eight here, we're doing it, and uh, it's me and Tim back on the mic, but we have a special guest today for all of you who are listening, uh, our friend Ian, we served with back at Dias, and uh, man, we have a long history together. He was one of my first supervisors, and uh, just a really, really, really good dude, Um there was a point of my Air Force career, I'll kind of go over brief, where uh, the Air Force was cutting people, and uh, I had some marks on my record that made me um, kind of top selection to be kicked out of the Air Force, just, just because they were downsizing, not because I was in like deep trouble, just because they were downsizing, and uh, he fought for me, and I'm still in today, and that was seven years ago, holy cow, so uh, Ian means a lot to me and I'm glad he's on the podcast with us and uh so everyone Ian how you doing man oh I'm good thanks for having me and I can't believe it's been that long yeah right I mean 2013 and now it's 2020 time flies man yeah I don't know where it goes <laughs> yeah me either if you're not paying attention it'll just go it like <laughs> it's crazy it sneaks up on you yeah time flies when you're having fun right yeah. <laughs> also <laughs> flies when you're not having fun. That's that's actually very true. One of my one of my favorite quotes actually says like whether you're willing to uh take the risk and take chances or whether you're willing to just sit around and waste time, time will pass anyways. So why not make the most of life and take that chance? Definitely true. So, how you doing, man? How's your uh how's life going? Oh, life's going. Uh, you know, busy with work, busy with uh, trying to keep up with COVIDs and not get it, and you know, just day to day civilian life. Uh, definitely, <laughs> definitely enjoy it better than my ten years that was in. <laughs> counting down the days. I'm counting down the days till I hit that till I hit that retirement period. There you I go. Gonna, I was gonna say you have quite a while there, Tim. No, halfway. <laughs> halfway. <laughs> you hit ten years this year. Ne- next year <laughs> oh that's that's cute man i remember when i was almost at my 10 year mark i'm past I that when i was almost my 10 year <laughs> <laughs> oh god so what do you what do you what do you do ian uh i'm i'm still a mechanic just not on planes uh i fix welding equipment plasma equipment i do a lot of work with automation um when it comes to manufacturing um plasma cutters uh, attached to tables, uh, we're getting into robots, welding robots. Um, so pretty big industry of just fixing some pretty cool equipment. Damn, that's pretty cool. So you're talking robots. Um, we're actually working with a company um, that like does like machine learning and AI type work with um, robots and trying to see if. Uh, they can get robots to understand and emulate the best parts of um, humans. And so it's kind of cool. See, that uh, to me sounds like some... I robot type, stuff? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My st- the stuff I work on is you see a picture of the, the car manufacturers with the robotic arms that do the welding and everything. That's the kind of stuff. Oh, wait, so there's not, there's not robots that fix the robots yet? No. 
No, nope, hopefully not because uh, I enjoy my job and they pay me well. Well, no, I mean, so. well, then there'll need to be robots to fix those robots, right? There's always going to, it can't just be robots all the way down. So you'll always need somebody to fix the robot that fixes something. Well, not necessarily. I mean, if you have robots that can assemble an entire car, I mean, you just get a robot to assemble the machine that assembles the car, right? <laughs> that just I mean, sounds like a lot of robots. Yeah, they just don't have a brain, though. Hey, you, I mean, a lot of these robots are starting to have brains. I mean, cars thinking for themselves or being programmed to do certain things that you aren't aware of, like identifying certain trends i mean when you uh when you go on google and you uh not sponsored by the way uh and you um do that <laughs> <laughs> yet yet um but you do that uh you know i'm a human type uh you know captures yeah yeah where you have to pick the pictures like every time you do that it learns what the correct pictures are based off of your selection and then it stores that data and after a while it just knows what the right one is and when people are choosing the wrong one so when you when you choose one that is wrong you're like oh crap i didn't mean to choose that but it says that it was correct anyways it's because they haven't identified the robot hasn't identified that as being wrong yet and so uh, over a long period of time when there's more wrong selection than right it'll identify that as ah that's actually wrong and so uh, when you go back and take it again and you select the same picture that was wrong it'll tell you you're wrong it's kind of crazy yeah, yeah. There's this really informative documentary starring Will Smith called I, Robot. It's really <laughs> eye-opening. Yeah. See, all of this is making me want to go live off the grid even more. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely suggest it um, until that house, the basics of a house is smart. Well, that's why they call them smart homes. So. No, yeah. no, that's a Disney movie. That's a Disney movie from the 90s, Smart House. Come on. Oh, really? Come on. I don't know about that. All I know is about Google Assistant. Again, not sponsored. <laughs> if Google ever sponsors our podcast, dude, that's going to be wild. That, that's Google, how you made it. Yeah. Google, I hope you're listening. You listen to no. everything else. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, uh, dude, that's cool. So you were uh, working as an aircraft mechanic in the military. Now you're working as a machine mechanic um, for uh any whatever company you work for, it doesn't really matter, but that's just what you do. Um, so you had mentioned earlier, I'm going to kind of take it deep here. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, you enjoy the civilian life much better than your 10 years in. Uh, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? What made your 10 years not so enjoyable? So, I mean, it's, saying it that way is kind of convoluted. Um, I enjoy my time out now because my life, my job at least, is stress-free. Um, being the aircraft mechanic, you guys know that you have lives in your hands, even if you don't realize it. Um, and so you have that extra level of stress of, okay, did I do everything right? Did I make sure this was correct before it flew? Um, now, really, there aren't any lives in my hands. My job is stress-free. Um, and I'm back to where I, I enjoy going to work every day. I enjoy the traveling that I do do. Um, so that's what I mean. Uh, my 10 years in was great for me. Uh, I'd say the best thing I ever did with my life was join when I did. And I say the second best thing I ever did with my life was get out when I did. Um, I will, I will never say that I regret joining the military. I will never say that it was bad for me. Um, it helped me grow up really quick and it did a lot for me and it made me who I am today. Um, but I do enjoy my life on the outside. Um, mainly, I mean, the biggest thing is cause I can grow a beard now. I don't have to shave. Anymore, so. <laughs> That's every military person's, um, like life hey. goal right there. Hey, it may be, it may be coming. They may be incorporating it. Fingers crossed. Um, all right, but, no, back, but back to what <laughs> back to what Ian was talking about. Um, I can one hundred percent relate about your comment about living stress free. Um, I didn't realize how much um, uh, I don't want to say emotional, how much mental stress I had on myself that was only put there because of myself, not because other people were necessarily making me feel mentally stressed. Um, because you have people's lives in your hand, um, even in the most secondary third even in like second, third, fourth kind of positions, like 
anything you do on that plane could come back and bite you and cause the death of those people flying it. And uh, I never realized that kind of stress until I got to my current job now where I'm kind of removed from that environment and I'm more in a training environment. Um, there's definitely a huge change in my stress levels, just even though I'm still quote, technically in the same career field, my job is different and that level of stress is nearly non-existent. Um, and it wasn't something I was aware of until I got to this job. So nearly 10 years into the military, I wasn't aware of the mental stresses on myself until I left what I was doing and did something else and was like, holy crap, I didn't realize the amount of uh, pressure I was placed, I, I, I was placing on myself until I got here and didn't have to worry about that pressure anymore. It was like, like if I wasn't already bald, I would be growing hair back kind of, kind of <laughs> levels of stress, uh, to try to lighten the mood. Um, it, it yeah, it is definitely eye opening the amount of mental fortitude you need in the kind of career field all three of us are in or were in, um, because of the, the stress of knowing that something you do on that plane and if you did it wrong could result in the death of at least four people and that's such a bizarre thing to think about now in retrospect that most people while they're in that job don't really think of it that way they think of it as just another job they're showing up to every day eight to ten hours a day five days a week unless they have weekend duty and to them it's just a job and then as you get more higher up in the ranks you're in that job longer you realize oh crap there's people who fly this plane that could die yeah, I mean, well, I think I think in reality they, you know, they kind of teach you that from the beginning, but you know, being young and naive, you don't really you don't really look at it, you know, as You don't think it could ever happen to you. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a much better way to put it. Like you really don't think it it's you, it seems like a rare chance. Like, ah, that's, you know, a one-off experience. Like, yeah. So, um yeah, I think you're 100% right. But I, when I got this job um, that I'm in right now, I'm actually just com working with computers, basically. I won't go too much into it. It's a long conversation. It's just kind of weird. But um, I don't do anything with airplanes um, anymore besides training. And yeah, I feel the same way. Just the stress of having people's lives in my hands, going to bed at night, wondering like, crap, did I... Did I put that spacer on right? Did I torque it to the correct value? And, you know, you know you did at the time, but as, you know, the day goes on, you you touch so many aircraft and you're doing so many things, and then you have to think about one specific experience, like, crap, did I? You know what I mean? And then, I mean, it just, it's extremely stressful. Um, but, yeah, we had a, we, uh, lost that plane in Afghanistan. You were there for that, right, Ian? Yep. Yeah, that was uh that was my plane um for that deployment and uh I was there for it all. Uh, I was one of the last people to touch it and I was one of the only, I want to say it was me and then um our pro super that was on that time that actually got formally questioned. Uh, while we were there, because um, my name was all over the plane, my name was all over the forms. Um, so yeah, I was I was there for that, and that was the uh, that was the factor for um, my PTSD and my anxiety and depression that came along with it, and that was the start of my downward spiral that led to me getting out and everything that happened since. Do you, um, sorry, if, if, if you wouldn't mind, only if you want, uh, can you kind of describe a little bit of maybe that day? Like when, when the news came out, like what was going through your mind as a mechanic? Um, so that day, it was October 1st. We'll start on that day. Um, uh, I'll take it back the day before, uh, plane came down on my shift with a engine overheat problem. And this was about the third day in a row that it had come down with that specific issue. And so I did my uh, in-between flight inspection, my through flight on it while engines was out there working on the plane. Um, they thought they, we thought we had had it fixed, went ahead. I left that night early. Uh, I, I was flying the next day on a different plane. So come 
uh, the 1st of October, uh, 2015, I wake up, I go about my normal routine for, okay, I got to fly today. It's going to be a long day. Um, I flew, came back probably about 10, 10 o'clock at night, Afghanistan time on the 1st. Um, I go, I turn in all my tools. I leave. Don't think anything about it. Um, as I'm walking in from the apron, from the parking spot that I was on, uh, 3174 is taxiing out, which was the plane that, that went down. Um, did the little, you know, gave them a little wave as I'm walking through. As they pass, seems like a normal day. I'm going into my day off. And uh, comes to be about midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning. Wi-Fi goes out. Um, so that, you, you know, that happens when you're deployed. Um, you don't really think anything of it. I'm sitting there watching movies. Uh, come about 3 o'clock in the morning, a guy from the other shift comes into my room and wakes us all up and says, hey, uh, we all got to go back in. I pull him aside, hey, what's going on? Um, he told me that they thought a plane had gone down. Um, so I, obviously we all get dressed. We all do that. Uh, we go to leave and everything. Um, we head to the squadron. All of us are there. Uh, everybody that's deployed with us, no matter if you were off sleeping, um, everybody's in this one room and they say, okay, this plane just crashed. Um, all we know right now is that they crashed. We don't know anything else. Anybody that's touched this plane within the last 72 hours or how many ever hours it was, we all then had to go over to the hospital and we all had to give blood, urine samples, fill out probably 20 pages of paperwork saying everything we had eaten, how many hours we had slept um, over the last three to five days. Um, and then we all got uh, our statements written and everything. And there was probably about 15 of us, 10 to 15 of us that had touched that plane over the last few days. So we get done. I get done, it's probably seven o'clock in the morning. So at that point I had been up for like 24 hours. Um, but it just, it still hadn't sunk in at that point to think, okay, we just had a plane crash. Um, it, it was very surreal going into trying to go to sleep and go back to a normal day-to-day -day routine. So it was, it was really surreal. Um, I, I don't think I really slept much that day when I was supposed to be sleeping. And the next day would be my day off. We still kind of went about our day as, as usual, my day off. And uh, it was, they stopped flying for the day as a, I guess, decision to let us kind of deal with everything. And, you know, they have colonels and, and everybody coming around making sure we're okay, saying, oh, if you need to talk to anybody, you can talk to anybody. Um, but it was just a very surreal feeling like you're in a dream. Um, it it took a, quite a while for it to really sink in. So it was, it was definitely something that I never thought I would go through and never want to go through again, if that answers that question. Yeah, no, that's... Uh... Thank you for answering that. I can't imagine how difficult that is to, you know, kind of walk through, um, especially since that's the thing that caused the PTSD in the first place. And um, so I know that's a hard question. I appreciate you answering that for us. Um, I just kind of wanted a better or a little bit more of an understanding of kind of your thoughts, you know, when you went through that day, because what were some uh, identifiers that you experienced or you saw in yourself that um kind of pointed you towards PTSD? So um, the deployment obviously had to go on. So we all were kind of just 
forced, I mean, not really forced, we kind of forced ourselves to kind of repress everything and hold everything back because we still had this, had three months left on this deployment. So over the deployment, they assigned me to another plane. Uh, I go about my business, uh, all in the back of my head, trying to figure out if I had done anything wrong. Um, especially because, like I said, I was, I want to say one of the only two people that were uh, formally questioned by the accident and safety investigation boards that were going on uh, to the point where my rights were read to me, um, record everything recorded, everything written down. Um, so obviously all that had me thinking in my head, okay, what did I miss? Um, I know that it, at first we had initial reports from the local media that, oh, an engine was on fire when it crashed and this and that. So that obviously kind of sparks everything. And for me, it sparked everything in my head, like a lot of second guessing. Um, I had been doing that at the time for eight years. And I had been working on the same plane roughly for the last eight years. And I had, I had, uh, a lot of pride in what I did and I did everything I could to to the best of my ability but then all of a sudden this one event make made me sit there and question everything um and for me it was thankfully there weren't any maintainers on board that I was super close with um but I was close with at least the pilot all of them I knew and I had flown with before but the pilot um was actually the pilot that I had took my last TDY on before the deployment. And that was kind of our get ready for deployment TDY that we went on. So I was super close with him. He knew who I was. I knew who he was, you know, the, the pilot FCC relationship that you can have. Yeah, absolutely. That I, that I had for a long time. Um, and so that, that kind of just, kinda, it started the snowball was knowing who it was, being the lead maintainer on that plane for the deployment, and then having these things. Um, the biggest thing for me was they didn't tell us. We had heard rumors of everything. We had been told, oh, well, these this is what this person's saying. This is what these people are saying. But I didn't put any of my stock into any of those rumors because I did not want to sit there and think, oh, well, it was this, and then come back and find out that it was something, um, something else. So I waited until, until they finally told us, but at that point they didn't tell us until we were back from our deployment. Yeah. It was, uh, it was six months later. We yeah. found out, we unofficially found out the accident report through a friend we were deployed with whose brother was a pilot in a different unit somewhere else that told him because he didn't understand why they why they hadn't told us as maintainers yet so yeah. i can totally i can totally understand that like we felt like we were on coals for the entire deployment because we didn't get informed about what the actual mishap was until we had gotten we didn't officially get informed until we were already home station coming back from our r and r and we're back to normal work when they were like oh by the way this was what happened and it was a uh, it was kind of it was kind of bullshit um <laughs> It really made a. It made me feel bad that they had already let other people know a month after the accident, but we were like you particularly. I can understand, but like even I felt like I was being dragged over coals. Oh um, yeah, because like I helped you often on that plane. When I wasn't working on my plane, I was helping you on your plane because neither one of us liked our our uh, opposites. <laughs> Uh, so it was definitely, it was, it was, it was a rough time because like, not to take away from your story, but that night we found out you pulled me aside as we were leaving the dormitory to be like, Hey, just so you know, um, they think the plane crashed and it's still on fire. And like, I will always remember the fact that like you grabbed me as we were leaving and like, I ended to talk to you and I was like, Oh my God, what's happening? And you're like, the plane's on fire. And th that it blew me away. Cause then we went to the, we went to the building and everyone had gathered up and like my first thought when we all got woken up because I like had just fallen asleep was like we were being attacked. And I think that's what everybody else assumed because they told us yeah. to get our battle rattle and get our weapons. And I was like, oh, great. We're under attack and we got to get in a secure location. And then just to find out it was a plane and then have to go give blood, give a urine sample, sit in front of a colonel and answer questions. Um, it was yeah, it, it was a rough night. So 
And then, our, and then the next day was our day off. The day they were like, hey, nobody has to fly today. Everybody gets a day off. And me and you were like, well, we've already had the day off. And we've both been awake for 24 hours at that point. Because I had just gotten off shift. You had just gotten back from that flight. <laughs> yep. So it was, uh, and then the next day it was just business as usual, except we were down one plane. Yeah. God, I, I, I kind of feel like that's the opposite of what you would want to do, right? Like provide a day off. You know what I mean? Like how how do you feel about getting another day off to just kind of sit and think in? Well, either way, that was our day off. Like that was me and Tim's day off, period. But they had decided oh, gotcha. to cancel all of our flights for the rest of the flying, for the for the flying portion of us and us. They just they stopped oh, a, it all wow. to give us a day. And I mean, I can understand giving you a day, but I can also understand. Um, in that environment you might just want to keep a routine so i can see it i can i can see it both ways yeah, yeah. like me and ian uh we, we did our normal routine and it was like the most lackluster routine ever we went to i think i think we still went to green bean i still i think we still went to the bazaar we went back to the building to like watch movies and like me and him were just like laying there like we tried to get into robin hood like we usually did because that's what we did for that whole deployment was doing Robin Hood trading because we thought we were the best at it. Um, <laughs> and we, and we'd ba- like, we basically just sat on the couch and we're just like numb about what was going on because it was just like, one, we were exhausted because at this point in our day off, it's 30, like 36 hours into being awake. No true sleep has happened um, because by the time we got out of the hospital for blood and urine, it was seven in the morning. So there's no reason to go to sleep at that point because you're just going to ruin your sleep cycle. So it was a it was a very very long thirty six forty eight hour period of just like lack of sleep to go right back to work as normal. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's numb is is a great word for that. It's kind of it's kind of crazy how the body fa- falls into that. You know, like with most traumatic experiences, um, like you, like you had said, it hadn't sank in yet, and uh, it seems to be kind of a common trend. Like when you experience something traumatic like that. Um, it's not until maybe a couple of days later that you actually start to really feel and understand what happened. And, uh, I think, don't quote me, but I, I think that's kind of what like the, the fight or flight that your body goes into, like it goes into a type of shock where it just registers like, okay, something serious is going on, but we still need to operate. So let's, let's just kind of keep pushing forward and we'll deal with the pain later. Um, exactly. So, yeah, that's that's crazy. I can't imagine. Um, so, so let's get uh, back. You said you came home um, after the deployment, found out you know, kind of what happened um, when you realized, um, you know, either way, it's such a traumatic experience. But uh, from your point of view, being a mechanic, worried about whether it was the steps you took that led to that, um, realizing that it wasn't, um, was there any relief whatsoever? Um, so there was relief there knowing that, okay, these, this was not my fault. Uh, there was relief in that, but then there was also, uh, I had a lot of survivor's guilt to it. Like, Mm. well, I was flying that day. Why couldn't I have been on that plane to where I could have either done something or, and it was, it's extremely selfish um, to think that and, and take away from everything. But that's just kind of what my brain went into. Well, why couldn't I have been the one that was on that plane instead of them to save their family the hurt? Um, so I had, a, I had a lot of that going on when I got back. And it's, it still took me several months from being back before I even realized that there was anything going on with me. I thought I was fine. I didn't realize that all of this had taken such a huge toll on me and the second guessing and then the, the guilt that I felt towards it because for the longest time I did feel like it was my fault. Um, so I felt the guilt of that, the survivor's guilt from them being gone and me not. And then the second guessing of everything kind of just, it piled up to the point where I got back, started sleepwalking, um, had a few different events that was kind of just off the wall, something I would never do. One being in the middle of the night, I was sleeping. Apparently, I started choking my my now ex-wife in her sleep and in my sleep without knowing it. Wow. Um, 
getting up, walking around the house, sleepwalking, never done it before in my life. And then kind of one of the final, the, the straw that broke the camel's back per se was, was one night I'm laying in bed, I'm just dead asleep. About 2.45 in the morning, I hear something banging, it jolts me awake. And my wife's laying next to me and she says something about it and I didn't really think much of it. I fall back asleep. 15 minutes later, does it again. I immediately roll out of my bed, type in the code to my safe that's under my bed, grab my pistol, and start walking around the house with a loaded pistol in the middle of the night. Um, and at the time, my kids were still young. So it's 2016, so I had a, a four-year-old and a two-year-old uh, in bed, not even 50 feet from me. Um, so just a, a simple banging that turned out to be gunshots down the street a little bit triggered something in me to immediately get up and without even realizing it, start walking around with a loaded pistol. Uh, at that point, I had realized, okay, something is going on with me. I don't know. I don't know what to call it. I don't know what to think about it because I'm having nightmares, waking up, sweating, having dreams about everything. So I I did whatever I could. I went up to the mental, I didn't even go to mental health on base. I just went to my PCM on base and said, hey, this is what's going on. I don't know what's going on with me, but something's wrong. Um, and thankfully, I did take those steps uh, because I was I was bad off to the point where when I would first, when I first started getting the, the mental health help and started going to therapy and seeing a psychiatrist, when I first started being able to go through that and I would first talk about the event, I couldn't get through talking about those days without breaking down into tears. I couldn't get through it without feeling like I was going to puke everywhere. Um, I would sit there and the room would spin and I'd be dizzy, but I'm to the place now and back then I couldn't do it, but now I can sit here and I can actually have a conversation about it and talk about how it affected me in those ways. Um, and so it, it took, so from the time it happened, October, I don't think I started getting help until April. So it wow. took a good six six months, uh, seven months from when it actually happened to when I realized that something was wrong with me. Uh, something more than just having some nightmares about it or having a few flashbacks or hearing a sound that makes you think of the sirens and then immediately kind of reacting to it and having that hypervigilance. It, it took that long. Um, to actually realize something was going on inside my head that you don't really think about. And the worst part about it is, is especially military world and then being a male, all that stigma of, oh, well, you, you should be fine. You shouldn't have any issue with this. Um, all that stigma kind of kind of made it really hard for me uh, I know when I first started going to be seen and I they came out with the diagnosis of PTSD I was ashamed to even bring it up really back then I was I didn't I didn't feel like there was a reason for me to to have post-traumatic stress disorder based on this event when yes it was a traumatic event that happened in my life and around me, but I wasn't quote unquote directly involved because I wasn't on the plane or I didn't watch it happen. So I know that I felt telling certain people that, that I definitely felt looked down upon because I said something and I, I did something about it, got the help that I needed and then was, had this diagnosis, um, for the, year and a half from the time we got back to the time that I got out um it was okay I'm afraid to kind of talk about it to when I got out I was I didn't care anymore at that point uh who knew if I if I was diagnosed with PTSD or not 
yeah, I still felt this, the stigma of, oh, well, you, you shouldn't have that, or you shouldn't, you, you shouldn't have those kind of emotional responses to this. Um, just kind of the stigma of mental health, even just in, in the male world, it's, it's still looked down upon. And I felt that, um, and that was a big thing on, on getting out when I did, um, I couldn't, I didn't trust myself anymore on planes because I spent six, seven months second guessing everything I did. I couldn't trust my, my judgment anymore. And then I was to the point where I said, you know, I just can't handle it. I can't, I can't do my job to the best of my ability anymore because of X, Y, and Z. And so that's what led me to, to get uh, med boarded and get out when I did was I, I knew I wasn't effective in my job anymore. I knew that I was never going to deploy again. I knew that I never was going to fly again. Um, so at that point, it was best for all parties involved to move on with my life and then move on and the Air Force to move on with other people. Yeah, so... So I remember coming back from that deployment, we all were kind of in a, uh, we all were kind of zombies, right? There was mm-hmm. a few people that it didn't seem to affect, um, but the large majority of us were all kind of zombies. It it took a while, I think, for everybody to kind of get back to baseline after that deployment. Um, but I definitely know for sure that like, just from my point of view, watching you, it was definitely affecting you in a much grander scheme. Um, and also because of the fact that you, you had your signature on all of the jobs on that plane and anything that ever happened in that plane, like you had like signed it off and said it was good. And, uh, so, so that's a much bigger mental, mental aspect for you than it was for like, for me who just like helped you with work every now and then. Um, and for everybody else who kind of just knew the plane was there, but didn't actually work on it. Yeah. But even, even looking in or, or like witnessing what was going on with you, like I noticed something was happening and I could tell that you were being affected by it, but like, I couldn't really reach out because I also was going through my own kind of stuff and I was trying to get myself back to where I needed to be. And then like, it just, but it honestly seemed like everybody started to like shun you as a maintainer. And I don't know if that was intentional or if it was just because of your own, uh, what's the word? Your own, your own, your own motivation was like kind of dropping off and your, uh, your willingness to like work and continue to work was also dropping off. And so I felt like you started like getting shunned. So I can definitely see that you may have had a harder time with what was happening because you were being shunned and then also being judged by those above you. Um, because I remember before you left, your last job was, wor- was basically working in the back of another office doing grunt work, ba- basically. And I don't know if that was your choice or if that's where, just where they put you because of your PTSD diagnosis. Again, they didn't really tell us anything and you weren't really talking to anybody. Um, but it, it definitely looked like you were just kind of pushed aside and kicked to the curb until you were finally, like, I don't even know when your last day was. Like, I don't, like, you were there at work one day. I think I went on leave or I went TDY. I came back and you were gone. Um, I don't think I ever got to say goodbye because you were just there and gone. Like, those that last year after that deployment, I I saw you probably a handful of times and then you had left. Yeah. Um, so I definitely felt that from supervision. And the, the me being in the office, that was my, my personal choice. Um, after, after, um, after I, they tried to blame me for a a bad prop. Uh, I was on day shift and I had two, three levels with me. We got put out on a plane to, uh, it was supposed to just fly normally. Uh, that was what was assigned to us. Of course, production screwed up the flying schedule. And that plane now had two hours to have the fuel load adjusted rig and go on TDY. So I, being with two, three levels, being the seven level, I had all this stuff to do. I didn't do a, a thorough walk around because midshift had done the pre-flight the night before. I'm sorry. I didn't have time to sit there and walk through it all. Uh, Pro soup comes out and uh, looks at that prop and says, oh, this prop is bad. Why didn't you catch that? Um, what? It was not my job to catch it. Um, first off, second off, when you give me two hours to adjust the fuel load, when most of the time I'm sitting there waiting on the fuel truck and trying to train these two, three levels to where I can have one of them upstairs while I'm in the back, 
Um, sorry, didn't have time. Um, so he didn't, Pro Soup didn't really say much to me uh, right then and there. Uh, plane goes out, I come back in, and I hear that they're trying, they're talking about giving me paperwork, they're trying to get me in trouble for this bad prop. I lost my mind. Um, you guys know where the Red Crew Chief office was at the time, right across from the Pro Soup's office, uh, Red Side Pro Soup. I come storming in that door, and I'm about to go right in there and just give them a piece of my mind and be like, look, no, you're not about to put this garbage on me. Uh, when tech sergeant, uh, one of our lead techs on days, threw me into the crew chief office, slammed the door, and calmed me down. At that point, I was like, okay, no, I'm done. I went to the shirt, and I told her, I said, look, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And that's when I went to my doctor and said, look, I can't. I can't do this anymore. They're going to sit here and throw me under the bus for something that's not my fault. And all this, I'm not going to continue putting my, uh, putting, putting myself out there for them. At that point is when my MEB process started. And once that started, um, I kept working for a little bit on the flight line. I finally got to the place where I didn't trust myself anymore. Um, and so I went to the first shirt and said, look, take me off the flight line. I'm not doing it anymore. And so that's why they put me in the back office to help out there. Um, because, yeah, it was just little piddly, oh, hey, I'm going to go organize this this row of chem boots. Um, but it was something that they could actually have me do and it wasn't going to cause too much issue. I was still going through all my appointments. I was doing everything I needed to do to get out um, and everything. And so... Um, that that's how it happened for me but you had mentioned so that was when you know you got to the back office you start you know doing your out processing you're looking to get out um so from the time that you finally out processed you're out you're gone um you know when you were in you had the docs you had all that stuff when you got out uh what were some steps what were some things that you did to kind of keep yourself on a on a positive path to handling your ptsd so that's kind of where my story doesn't look good um, on my part. Uh, when I got out, I thought I was as good as I was going to get. I didn't think I was going to get much better. Um, I went from seeing a therapist on base every week to two weeks and a psychiatrist once a month to getting out. I was only seeing a psychiatrist once every three or four months. I wasn't even seeing a therapist anymore. Oh, wow. I, I thought I was, I thought I was quote unquote cured. I knew that, I know that PTSD is not something that you can just be quote unquote cured from. It's always going to be there. It's just a matter of how you handle it. Um, I thought I was better. I thought I was as good as I was going to get. So I went about my life and I went, I went into a downward spiral from the time I got out until January of 2020. So May, 2017 to January 2020, two and a half years of just working. I had a job on the outside doing what I do now, um, traveling quite a bit for it, um, a lot of drinking. Uh, I, I turned to a lot of drinking, and I was still on all my all the medications that I was prescribed when I was in. So I thought I thought I was handling it. Um, I was not, um, obviously, uh, it ruined, I'm, I'm, it's going to sound drastic, but it ruined my life. Um, after I got out, you can, you can force a drug addict to, to go to rehab, but that rehab rehab is not going to take until they're ready. And yeah, it, that's true. It took those two and a half years of, of drinking. I mean, my marriage was already on the rocks because of the PTSD from when I got back until now, uh, but it just completely disconnected that to the point where my wife and kids moved out, and once that happened, I was like, you know what, what's the point? Um, so November of 2019, and this was the two years or whatever, after getting out, not really doing much for my own mental health, um, 
November 2019, they move out and I had my first suicide attempt. Um, I, I hit that, that low point that I thought there was no point left to live anymore. Um, thankfully, uh, whatever in my head told me not to. And so I moved on. I was like, okay, I'm going to handle this. I, I got this. It's not a big deal. Um, so that was the end of November of 2019. So a year, a little over a year ago, um, from then until January, I spent just about every day drinking, um, just drinking. Trying, are you trying to like escape those thoughts, those, uh, suicidal thoughts that were still probably obviously there, right? Exactly. I was, I was trying to drink my pains away. I would get off work. I would drink until I decided to go to sleep. I'd wake up, I'd go to work. I'd do it again the next day. And I did this for, um, I had a ridiculous CPS case brought against me. Um, and so there was a, a good span to where I couldn't, I couldn't see my kids. I wasn't leaving my house. I didn't, I didn't feel like I had anybody around me um, that I could turn to. And so all that started happening. And come January uh, 20th of 2020, I hit the lowest point in my life. I found out that at the time we were still married, I found out my wife had moved on. And I didn't want that. I wanted to try and fix it. And that's not what she wanted. So that kind of just spiraled me even further um, to the point where that night I tried to I tried to drink myself to death. Um, I hadn't really eaten that day. And I got home about 930 from seeing my kids. Uh, I went to dinner with them. I got home after trying to have a conversation with my ex. And it didn't go the way I wanted. So I had decided on my drive home, I said, you know what, this is, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not going to do this life anymore. I'm, I'm sick of it. Um, so I got, got home and I had told myself that, okay, if I pass out, I'm going to make sure I pass out on my back. I'm going to do everything I can to not wake up tomorrow. And somewhere in my drunken state i had sent a text message to my mom and it was i think it was about 11 o'clock so they should have been way asleep they're an hour ahead in in eastern time so it's midnight there they have their normal things this was a monday night um so it shouldn't have been they shouldn't have been awake but for for whatever reason they were awake and they my mom saw my text message and called me and I somehow answered, I don't remember most of this because I was severely intoxicated. So far gone. Yeah. I was there. There's a good three hour span that I don't remember of that night. Um, I just know what I was told and what I kind of have flashes of. So I come to on the phone with my mom crying on my kitchen floor. And I had music playing in my house and it was just up as loud as it could go. I was trying to drown everything out and I had my mom on my fo- on the phone with me and then coworker who was in the military with us in the 317th with us, um, Carl, who lives right down the road. My mom had his phone number after she found out about my first attempt and said, look, if anything happens, I'm going to call him because he's so close to you. And I mean, we, we, we've known each other for however long. And so he's at my front door at like 1230 at night, one o'clock in the morning. I open the door in my drunken state and kind of, kind of go in and out for the next couple hours. I come to again with the police in my, in my living room with another friend of mine from being in that I work with now. And so I've got three people in my living room 
one being a cop, two being my coworkers that got dragged into this. And I, I just kind of finally hit that place where I was like, you know what, something's wrong. I need more help than what I'm getting myself. Um, so that next morning I went and I checked myself into an inpatient, a mental inpatient facility. And I told myself I'm, I'm done with the, I'm done with the past. The past is over. I can't change that. Uh, I, I'm going to take everything I can from this time of getting away from everything to focus on me, focus on my issues. And I spent eight days inpatient. Um, and it was, it was the right person at the right time telling me the right message. And it, it, it's kind of, it's ironic and crazy how it worked out that the therapist I was assigned was also somebody I had known from the military who was aircraft maintenance when I first got the dais. Wow. Was, was then cross trained into mental health. He PCS'd a couple times, ended up coming back to dais, and then got out shortly after I did. And then our paths cross again. Like I hadn't thought about this guy in years. And here he is able to relate to everything I'm saying, able to just reiterate the stuff that I already knew. And it, it was the right person at the right time telling me the right things. And once I hit, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say rock bottom, but I don't like rock bottom where humans will find a way to get deeper than rock bottom. Um, but I hit the lowest point in my life. And then at that point I finally realized, and it finally clicked in my head, in my stubborn head that I needed more help and I needed to get this under control. So I spend that time in and I think most of my issue is just the fact that I'm losing my family. I lost, lost my wife, lost my kids. Um, I thought that was my issue. Come to find out, I still had all these issues. I was so angry um, about the plane crash in 2015, and I was still so mad about it that I was not I was not a pleasant person anymore. I was always yelling at my kids before they moved out. I was always on edge. Um, I was always angry. And it took all of these things to happen after the plane crash, the the losing my family, the the trying to commit suicide twice for me to finally realize that this plane crash in this one event five years ago still had so much hold over me and still was so prevalent in my life that I, it was running my life. It was, it was running it and it was ruining it. Um, so I hit that, I hit that point in my life. I decided, you know, it's time to turn it around and um, I spent my, I always joke and say that I was locked up for eight days. Um, cause it kind of felt that way, but <laughs> I mean, it, it, it was, it was a good thing for me. It's what I needed at the time. And I came out at the end of January, right at the beginning of February of 2020. And then I spent the next six months of going to therapy, a group therapy three times a week for three hours a week. Um, just continuing to work on me and stop worrying about everything that I can't control. Stop worrying about everything around me and just focus on me and what I needed to get to where I wanted to be. And it took, it took a lot of work. And from January to now, I'm a completely different person. Um, I no longer am angry like I was. Uh, about the plane crash yeah it still sucks i'm still mad about it but i'm not it's it's not it's not ruling my life anymore like it did for four years i mean it's it's always going to be part of something it's always going to be something that's a part of us as people exactly like, yeah it, it it's a uh, it's not to interrupt what you're talking about one of the like when me and my wife went to therapy um our therapist said something really touching really like uh it was really empowering he was like you don't have to forgive that person 
but you have to forgive yourself. So it's not like you have to forgive the people involved or the, or like the biggest step forward is forgiving yourself about what happened. Even if it's something not related at all, it's a plane crash that we had no hand in. There was nothing we could do about it, but forgiving yourself for what happened, even though it's not your fault is like a huge step forward in the right direction because like, even though the people involved, they may not be able to help you, you being able to forgive yourself is, is a lot for your brain to help you move on. Exactly. And that's what, that's what most of my eight days, um, in the inpatient facility was me doing was forgiving myself for the plane crash, forgiving myself in the, in the guilt that I had towards it. And then moving on to forgiving myself for my portion in making my marriage fail and my life falling apart. Um, once I got there, once I was really able to sit back and look at myself and say, okay, I, I do forgive myself for these things. I was able to then move forward. I was able to start setting my goals of, okay, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to be with my, my life emotionally, physically, spiritually, um, mentally everything uh, I was then able to look towards the future instead of looking to the past because I'd spent so many years looking at the past and letting the past rule my future um, that I missed so much I missed time with my kids them growing up I missed missed so many opportunities to fix um, my marriage I missed so many different things um all because I was too busy looking backwards instead of looking forwards. And, uh, yeah, I think that's kind of, um, I think it's kind of crazy how you, how you said that, you know, um, you let the past rule your future. That's such an important lesson to learn is to just be present and be in the moment because there's a lot of stuff going on around you. And if you're too focused on the past, like you were, or some people, are too focused on the future like that's something that I, I had a problem with um, was being too focused on what I wanted my life to look like and I wasn't in the in the present I wasn't focused on what was going on and yeah we miss a lot of stuff if we don't just be present yeah uh, so so what so what are you actively doing um, in like now uh, to help you in your progress to like not necessarily fix your brain, but like help yourself heal, help yourself get back to a baseline, even though it may be a new baseline to what it was prior to the 2015 plane crash. Uh, what kind of progress are you making nowadays? Um, so yeah, I, it's my baseline will never go back to what it was. It's always a new normal. Like everybody talks about now. Um, I'm getting to my new state of normal and the biggest thing for me was the the therapy that I did. I was around a group of veterans that all had some form of PTSD or uh, depression, anxiety, substance issues. We all had the same mindset. We all had the same kind of okay. We can understand where you're coming from instead of. So my biggest biggest help to me was doing six months of three times a week for three hours a day, going and being able to talk to these people and listening to their problems and give them insight and have them give insight to me on my issues. Um, that was the biggest thing. The next thing that I did was I, I finally um, decided to get back into my own spiritual life. Um, I, after, before the crash, I did the whole church thing. Um, after the crash, I was just too angry. I was angry at myself. I was angry at the world. I was angry at God and everything. Um, and so that was the other thing. I got back into uh, my spiritual life, and I was able to then make new friends and find a new family, in quotes, um, that was willing to accept me where I was, um, the broken point of the broken part of me they were able to accept that um and then i found and then i found several things that i could do as quote unquote coping skills um those days that it were bad i still i still have my good days i still have my bad days that that's just going to be how life is 
Um, but I know that now on those bad days, I can sit there. I started going back to the gym. I started um, taking yoga, yoga classes as not only a way for my physical health, but also it was a, it's a great way for me to just sit there and focus on what I'm doing for that hour long time frame instead of focusing on everything outside. Um, and I kind of look, link that towards meditation. I know we were talking about meditation earlier. Um, that was, that's something that I could sit there and just recenter myself and say, okay, I need to block everything else out. Um, so I still do that. Uh, music has always been a big thing for me, listening to music, immersing myself in music. Um, started teaching myself two different instruments to learn to just something to do and and the last thing I did that I still do is journaling um as juvenile as it may sound or as silly as it may sound um when I have those days that I I want to say something to this person or that person or I feel like I didn't get to say this, I can say it. I can sit there and I can write it down. And that kind of puts a little bit of a closure in my mind of where my thoughts are going or where my dreams were. Um, so th those are the things that I still do. Um, obviously, I still, I still see a therapist. I still, well, I mean, I haven't seen a therapist in months. I've talk to a therapist over the phone uh same with psychiatrists with the whole you know covid um so life looks a lot different but it's also looked so much better my outlook on life is so much better i've got my next couple year goals i have my 11 and a half years to my big goal that i have set um so it's 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 being present it's handling thoughts as they come in it's handling the feelings and emotions and staying mindful to all of that as well as me working towards something in the future that's been my biggest help has been okay i can do this so i can get here or i'm going to realize why this feeling is coming up or why this emotion is coming up and that that's what's been the biggest thing for me. Well, I think that's actually, um, I, I really like the journaling aspect, right? So uh, you talked about yoga, and I think that's fantastic. You said that it allows you to focus on one thing and nothing outside of that. And uh, much like when you were drinking or when you were, you know, playing that music too loud, you were trying to drown that that stuff out of your head and that was the coping you chose at the time but now you're choosing yoga you know and so it's it's a matter of replacing those negative habits with something positive and you're choosing yoga and i love the journaling i love journaling um i'm i'm a person that likes to talk hence the reason i started a podcast uh with tim is because i i just love to talk and so uh a lot of times i'll do vlogs to myself and if i'm going through like a really hard time if i'm just in a really low place i will literally talk to essentially myself on how i'm feeling in that spot so that when i'm making or repeating those mistakes all i have to do is pull that video up and just look at myself and be like man, I, wait, 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 I'm making, I'm making the same mistakes. I'm going down the same path. I need to change direction here. And, uh, so we use obviously the journal a little bit differently, but, um, you know, I think journaling is fantastic. I'm, I actually created a journal, um, that I think will be really, really cool. I'm looking to publish it. Um, but, um, I think it'd be, it's going to be phenomenal. I've literally taken my experience with journals and and the things that I wish were inside journals and put it inside of a journal. And so maybe I'll send a copy to you and you can tell me what you think. Um, but yeah, that's fantastic. I think this is, uh, this is really kind of a cool experience for us. Cause we, I don't think we knew the full scope of your story and we're really, really happy and proud of you for taking those steps and making those changes. And, um, you know, it's, 
it's such an amazing story for you to share because of how, you know, the things that you went through, the people that you were having trouble with, uh, you know, all the trials and tribulations that you, you faced and then where you stand now when you finally stood up and said, you know what, I'm done and uh, I'm ready to be better. And so um, I think, you know, Tim would agree with me, you know, we're, we're proud of you, man. And uh, we're proud of everyone else that, you know, takes that step and makes that change because it's it's needed you know the time is now to make that change the time is now to start being in that stage of progression and getting better with your life getting better with yourself and uh, one thing I really liked that you said was that you focused on you 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 couldn't focus on everything else going on around you that you couldn't control all you can control is you and uh, that's like that's like the number one um, is, and that's why we have, you know, the one in six with catch my six is it's one, it's, it starts with you. And, uh, so that's just phenomenal. Uh, Tim, you got anything left you want to share? Uh, yeah. So I, I just wanted to like reiterate the whole, the, the, you said journaling was juvenile and it, it 100% is not juvenile. It is, it is one of the easiest first steps anybody can take in, uh, helping their own mental health. Cause just being able to write down your thoughts is uh, so strengthening for your mental fortitude that it, like it's every therapist I've ever spoken to is like, just write your thoughts down. And you're always like, just write them down. What does that even mean? And they're like, just write them down. Cause like seeing them in a different format can help you better process what's going on. Um, I keep a dream journal. I write down my dreams cause I'm really into lucid dreaming. I like being able to control my dreams when I'm asleep. So I dream journal. And so my journals are like the most bizarre things. Like they're just like the craziest things you could imagine. Um, so there's nothing juvenile about journaling. It's 100% a fantastic mental health tool that in my opinion everybody should do because it's it's easy one because paper's cheap and it's private nobody has to see it it's just you and yourself and it, like there's nobody else there um and it, it's super super strengthening something that can do really good to help you out um and yeah so i like so don't please don't think it's a juvenile kind of aspect because it's it's far from juvenile it's very much something that everybody should be doing and it's really 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 good for mental health in my opinion i completely agree with you and i didn't mean to make it sound like i think it's juvenile i think it's great um i just feel like as it's I feel like in that sense that there is a stigma around <laughs> it um yeah, not just like mental health but oh you journal you're a 32 year old man journaling. Um, I feel like there's that behind it. Yeah. Te um, so teenage, I, I teenage girls agree. aren't the only ones with journals. <laughs> exactly. I've, I've got notebooks all over my house. I still have the notebook that I have from when I was inpatient that I wrote everything down in, um, that I still go back and look at and read through to see where I was and to see the, where, I, how far I've come. So I, I love journaling. Yeah, they're they're great milestone markers. Really good milestone markers. Yeah, and a lot of uh, a lot of people uh, like um, like big athletes or you know a lot of very successful people journal. And somebody that I follow a lot, but he was on a podcast, um, and he had he had said that you know there was a point in his career where he was really low um, because there was a lot of hate mail coming to him, and uh, so. He was about to quit and just not do CrossFit anymore. And he started journaling and wrote down like, okay, why am I having these thoughts? Where are they coming from? Are they productive? So on and so forth. And he says that now there's journals all over his house. Well, he calls them notepads, but you know, notepads all over his house. And whenever he, whenever he gets into that mindset, he grabs a notepad, sits down. Okay, where are these thoughts coming from? Why? What are the emotions? So on and so forth. And he just goes through them. And uh, so, you know, don't, yeah, don't knock journal. Uh, journals are fantastic. And like I said, um, I'm having one published here pretty soon. So keep your eyes out. Oh, yeah. And uh, definitely proud of where you've come Ian, for sure. Cause like, like I said, I don't remember your last day when we were in the military. Um, not that you fell off the face of the earth, but like everybody, like I had my own stuff I was going through. You had your stuff you were going through. People lose touch. So definitely 100% that I'm 100% happy that you're still alive. Um, really upsetting to hear about your suicide attempts, but really glad to hear that you are doing much better than you were doing and you're on the right path moving forward and getting the help you need. And that's, that's really great to hear. Thank you. I, I, it took a long time for me to be proud of where I was and 
be proud of the steps that I made, but I'm to that place where, where I do have pride in what I've done and what I've gone through and what I've uh, made it through. And that's the biggest thing. Once you lose that, you're, you're back to being at, at a very low place that nobody wants to be. Well, um, I think that's pretty much the end of this podcast. Uh, that's pretty much all the time we have. Uh, we've uh, This is one of our longest podcasts, but it was definitely worth it. Uh, before we start closing out, um, Ian, is there anybody that you want to make a shout out to or a group of people or anything? I noticed there's a lot of stuff going on in your Instagram. I didn't know if maybe there's somebody you wanted to just thank for you know being there for you through this process and kind of helping you along the way. If that's something you want to do, if not, it's totally fine. Um, so obviously my biggest people I, I would love to thank are my parents, uh, my mom and my stepdad have been my rock through all of this. Um, they've been there for me. They, I mean, yeah, they live 1500 miles away, but they're still, they've still been there for me. Other than that, my, my two coworkers, Tim and Carl, yeah, thanks. Thanks again for coming on. Thanks again for joining us. We are proud of where you've come from where you were. Uh, just know from this point forward, you know, you obviously know, but you have us here for you as well. You have our numbers. Give us a call whenever, if you ever need anything. And, um, you know, all of you, all of our listeners that are coming in every week and listening, we're proud of every one of you for, you know, taking that step and just pushing the play button and listening to these experiences seeing if maybe you relate and just kind of taking notes on the steps that they've taken to get better and maybe trying those yourself. We're proud of you. Always progression, never regression. You can't change yesterday and you cannot predict tomorrow. All you've got is today. So just be better today than you were yesterday and you'll always be in that state of progression. Thanks for coming. We'll see you guys next time.